So our, our series continues to be We Are Witnesses, and it's out of the lectionary in the, UM, uh, the United Methodist Church, and this week is What God Called Clean. And so the passage uh, today is out of Acts chapter 11, verses 1 through 18. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. Uh, aside, that was a big deal, you know, the, because for the, the Jews were the chosen people, and the unchosen was everybody else. Yeah, the Gentiles. So, so for the Jewish faith, because Jesus was Jewish, for, for this message to come to Peter was a big deal because it opened up to us all. But I think that happens in this passage, so I should probably get back to reading it. That would probably be better. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him. Shocker. <laughs> say, say, why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. And it wasn't me, it was God's fault, because he... Wait, no, that's not in there. That's Mike. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time the voice answered from heaven, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. And this happened three times. This is an aside. Isn't it interesting that for Peter, so many things happened three times? Some people are slower than others. <laughs> He'd probably have to tell me ten times. So, so <laughs> three maybe not very many times. What this happened three times, then everything was pulled up again to heaven at that very moment. Three men. How many men? Three. Interesting. Sent to me from Caesarea, arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will baptize with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I would hinder God? And when they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. And everything changed. Changed everything. It's a familiar story. It's Peter's vision on the rooftop. It's the explanation about why we can eat fried shrimp and shrimp scampi and shrimp that likes shrimp and grits and all, the, you know, all, the, all this good food that we get, that we get to eat. Uh, thanks, Peter. Appreciate that. Rise, kill, and eat, kill, and eat. Give us all kinds of permission to change our diet, include all kinds of wonderful things. Otherwise, we wouldn't get to eat bacon, and we got to have bacon. Bacon is important. So, so an important story to say the least, right? You know, this would have been, I didn't, I should have set this up with Corrine. This would have been a great sermon to have right before a church potluck. You know, we could have had a great dinner. Except that isn't what it's about at all. It doesn't have anything to do with food. Despite that imagery and the vision, this is about people. Which makes it infinitely more messy. Our text this week isn't the actual vision. That happened in chapter 10, and this isn't an analysis of the vision. Peter had done that immediately after it happened in that chapter. But what's happening here is Peter is explaining himself to those in the fellowship. He went back to the church to tell them why he was changing things. So he went back to the fellowship, and he's telling them, and they don't like it. I know that shocks people, that people in the church don't like change. 
You know, don't we all want change as long as we don't have to do anything different? Just saying. Peter's crossed the line in the eyes of some of those who are now standing up and accusing him. Why are you doing this? What's going on? And what we don't have, and it would have been helpful to us if we did, is the sense of the tone of the people who approached Peter. Because we don't know how they approached him. We can imagine and might have experienced something similar. I I don't know. but, But it's possible that they came calmly up to him, rationally, and asked Peter, Excuse me, sir, what is this that thou doest? This is not what we have been doing. This is quite different. I don't think that I like it. They could have come up to him like that, I guess. Why are you changing the rules? I just learned the rules. And if not the rules, then certainly the practices that they've been following. They've been following consciously, unconsciously, since they began this new venture. And so this is all brand new stuff. And now this step has caused them to reconsider who they are, their calling, what does it mean to be called the church. So they needed to sit down and get together and decide who they will be from here on out. And it's very possible that it happened that way. And I would love to think that it did happen that way, except I've been in the church a long time. Experience tells me it wasn't quite so so calm. (laughs) When long-held beliefs and practices are threatened, people tend to lash out. Their voices tend to get raised and fists tend to get shaken. How dare you change what we're doing? That's not how we do it here. Who do you think you are? I actually got this email, this church. Mike, this is not, this is our church. This is not your church. How dare you change? And in the midst of that, I have seen this happen. I saw this happen at Sugarloaf, growing church, blowing, growing. The color of the carpet. You remember that? Ran a family out. Red or blue. Long-standing relationships are broken in those moments. The accusers felt challenged, felt wronged, felt unheard. It's a tense moment in the early church. This is a big deal. This is a transformative moment. But Peter stood his ground and passed the blame. You know, isn't that funny that we do that? <laughs> what happened in the garden? That wasn't me, it was her. <laughs> oh, Eve, what happened? It wasn't me, it was a snake. You know, that's kind of what we do. And so Peter did. He said, it wasn't me, it was God. This wasn't just an idea that I had or a strategy to, I decided to employ. This was a direct revelation from God himself. And let me tell you, that's a hard line to argue, but it's also a hard line to support. And perhaps the folks at that time were more in tune with hearing the voice of God than we tend to be today, and maybe they were more accepting of visions, but perhaps not. Not surprisingly, not a lot is said about what happened after this conversation. Was it convincing? Was the end of that, 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 was there that shrug of shoulders and a general acceptance of this incredibly radical change to the practice and understanding of what it meant to be a Christian, a follower of Christ? The story seems to imply that. The church definitely spread, grew leaps and bounds into the Gentile world, into our world, into the non-Jewish world. The mission takes off by leaps and bounds despite there being moments like Paul taking John Mark and John Mark turning back. And then first mission trip, second mission trip, Paul and Barnabas wanting to go on a mission trip together and Barnabas saying, let's take John Mark. And Paul saying, there ain't no way in the world I'm taking that guy. He turned around. And then two mission trips formed. Twice as many people. God is like that. God's an exponential God. God. God will reach more people despite us, you know? 
And there's still a few hints that battles have to be fought, you know. Just like Peter in this text, Paul is called on on the carpet for extending his circle too wide, including those who should not be included, or at least not included in the way that Paul wanted to include them. He argues that it wasn't him, but the Holy Spirit that fell, and there was nothing he could do but go along. Maybe it was all accepted and the new direction of the church went without a hitch. But I doubt it. More likely, there was anger and digging into the heels and possibly even a schism as the newly forged uh, community of faith steps forward. You know, the first reformed true followers of the way of, of Jerusalem church. It's made up of those who decided not to accept what Peter was saying. Who knows? What's clear, though, is that something changed. Some understanding, some position, some rule, written or unwritten. It just wasn't clear what exactly that meant. This vision, this redirection was not about food, though. It's interesting that the vision came as food because it had nothing to do with food. That's clear to Peter, at least. It's not a new way of looking at bacon or shrimp. It's a new way of looking at people. What God has made clean, you must not call profane. Say that with me. What God has made clean, you must not call profane. That's the very word that came to Peter in this vision. The one put into practice at that very moment when some, pe- some pe- three men appeared at his door. I don't know what the three is about, but I'm going to study it and see because this is just crazy that it happens so much for him. Statements about people. The people God has made clean. Peter must not call them unclean or profane people. We have an exclusive faith. Did you know that? We have an inclusive, exclusive faith. Isn't that weird? There is one thing about Christianity that is absolutely exclusive. Anybody care to guess? That nobody can do anything. Nobody can. <laughs> one thing. They're the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, one non-negotiable for us, you know, you don't follow Gandhi, you don't follow all the other, you know, you don't follow Allah. Our premise is that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. That is the exclusive tenet of the Christian faith. But you know who's invited to come? Everybody. All, all, right? Yeah, yeah, we'd say that around here once in a while. All. We, we include everybody. Hmm. The Gentile race, non-Jews, they've been considered unclean, therefore unapproachable. And catch up, Peter argued. He said, no, Lord, I haven't done that. I haven't eaten anything unclean. I haven't done any of that. I don't hang out with those people. I don't do none of that. And God says, that's not what I'm saying. You know, now, in intimate settings, you get together, eat together, abide together, acknowledge the existence of, uh, and things like that. Your life stuff, do life together, be in mission together, go play cornhole together. Go, <laughs> they had a softball team around here once. Go do stuff together. There's no word that says the people named here are now made clean, and those people over there are still in the unclean category because those categories are done. Peter's interpretation and his vision was way larger than that. In the previous chapter, he says, But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. In Acts 10, 28, a little later, in Acts 10, 34, he says, I truly understand that God shows no partiality. We just sang a song, right? What was it? Philip, you said, come as you are. You get to come as you are. Is that true? It's absolutely true. Here's the other beautiful thing. God loves you so much, he will refuse to leave you there. You meet God, you will be changed. An encounter with the living God cannot result in anything but us changing. He's too incredible. He's too big. He's too massive. He's too amazing. I've been sober for, I don't even know, 30-some odd years. That's not possible. I've done it wrong way more than I've done it right, and yet I stand before you. I haven't... I, 
You know, we add that up once a year, and it freaks me out every time. You know, I'm an oil field drunk that couldn't stay clean and sober, methamphetamine and alcohol. And yet here I am now, I'm in a pulpit. What in the world? What's wrong with God? Isn't that crazy? Unclean. me. Profane. That's me. What did God tell Peter? You should not call any anyone unclean or profane. You know who that includes? You know who else it includes? I only see like two hands, and it ought to be every single one of you. It includes all of you. God sees us so differently than we see ourselves. He doesn't say you are now not unclean. He doesn't say these people should be included. He just simply says all. Think about that. Is it any wonder he was challenged in this behavior, in this interpretation? Is it any wonder that when he got back to the church, the people were saying, wait, a minute. You know? You mean every, all? What about that group? What about that nationality? What about that ethnicity? What about the ones whose hair, is, whose hair is this way? They speak like this. Or the ones who are just flat out different. What about all them? They don't count, do they? I have seen that God shows no partiality. Don't be calling things that the ones that I made unclean. Don't call them profane. It's a radical change, radical hospitality. That, that, that's what's represented here. It's a rethinking of our role as witnesses to the Christ we follow. Love this thing. I watched it again. I watched the whole sermon this time. You've seen a video of it in here. I post it on Facebook all the time almost. Uh, Alistair Begg, I think his name is, goes through this whole thing about the thief on the cross, you know, and coming up and, and, and being accepted into heaven and going through all of that and says, how, why, how can you be in here? And he says, because the man on the middle cross said I could come. The man on the middle cross, the man on the middle cross says, I can come. And that's why we get to come. You know? And I watch that all the time because I have a tendency to be cynical and judgmental. I know no one else does, but I do. And by watching that, it reminds me (laughs) the simplicity of us in this faith that we claim. Because I sure want everybody to know about the doctrine of Scripture and the doctrine of grace and all of those things. So the church, who we are, we say come. Rather than judgment and exclusion, we proclaim acceptance and inclusion. Accept that Jesus is the only way. It's a very different inclusion than what we talk about in, in the world of justice in the world today. And he's serious about it. Second Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count him to be, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any would perish, but that all should reach repentance. And repentance isn't another churchy word. What it really means is turn around. I was going this way. I repent. I go this way. Repentance. First Timothy 2, 3 through 4. Who does God want to be saved? This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all men and women and kids and everybody to be saved. All to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And Jesus, right before he died, on the, in that last week, 
entering into Jerusalem. He quotes an Old Testament scripture, but his heart is just on his sleeve. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wing. And you are not willing. And you are not willing. We live in a world that's skeptical of Christ. We live in a world that doesn't believe. We live in a world that thinks something. You, know, you talk to people out there and they'll tell you that you believe in a fairy tale. Share what you've seen, heard, and experienced of God, and that will change perhaps. But that's not our job. Our job is simply to witness. But if they weren't willing to hear Jesus, don't take it personal if they're not willing to hear you. But they'll never hear you if you don't speak. You know, preaching about food might have been easier this morning. <laughs> but I don't think it would have been nearly as transformative. I don't think it would have been nearly as powerful. And frankly, it would not have been the gospel. The dunamis, the dunamis of the gospel, the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit, the dunamis, don't you just want to say it? Dunamis, dunamis, be a church of dunamis, be a church of dynamite, be a church of dynamite. Dynamite. We are witnesses to the power of of the Holy Spirit at work in the world. And we're invited to stand with any and all who declare and declare them clean. Why? Because God did. Dunamis. Because the Holy Spirit lives within us. Dunamis. Wants to speak through us. Dunamis. Mark is okay. Dynamis. These guys are going to want to sing a song, aren't they? I want to, you know, this is one of those moments, you know, I'm kind of sitting here waiting on, on the Holy Spirit because he's not done, you know. And I get a lot wrong, but one thing that I have been graced with is <laughs> the ability to wait. <laughs> you know, it's, I wish there was a way to, kind of take what is contained in, in, the, in these moments with the Holy Spirit and just let people know how real this is and how real God is and, you know, the impossibility. I, I am taken back again this morning that I have a history and yet I am your pastor and that God called me to this and that I get to be here and I get to experience him pretty much weekly up here, you know. Um, I did more wrong than right for a long time. I don't know your history. I don't know who you are. I don't know what, you know, the quiet stuff is, the stuff we don't bring to church. But I know this. The God who has delivered me is waiting to deliver you. And all you have to do is let him. Dunamis. So let him. Amen.